All right, we're in, we are, we are in, we are looking at Acts 26. We're moving along in Acts, for those of you who come occasionally, like y'all. <laughs> and we're looking at Paul, giving his testimony before King Agrippa in Caesarea. Along, and along with Agrippa is his sister Bernice, as well as Festus, the uh, proconsul of Judea, plus every notable person in Caesarea, both Jewish and Gentile. <clears throat> and they were all there to hear Paul give his personal testimony. Okay, this is very interesting. He's, that's what he's doing. And if you remember, Paul starts out talking about his zealous Jewish life and how he persecuted this new Christian church. But then he told them about how he had met the risen Jesus on the road to Damascus. And that's what we looked at last time. He was blinded by a glorious light, the glorious light of God, and he was then he was led by hand into Damascus, and there's that's where he was converted to be a follower of Christ. And as Jesus spoke to Paul on the Damascus road, Paul is now recounting all of this to King Agrippa. Okay, what a wonderful testimony this is. So that we're going to start out where we were last week in Acts 26, verses 16 through 18. Who's got that? But get up and stand on your feet. For this purpose, I have appeared to you to appoint you a minister and a witness, not only to the things which you have seen, but also to the things in which I will appear to you, rescuing you from the Jewish people and from the Gentiles, to whom I am sending you, to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the dominion of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who have been sanctified by faith in me. Yeah, this was, this was God's commission to Paul, to minister and witness to things that he had seen, but not only that, but also to the things which God is going to show him, uh, both to Jews and Gentiles. He's, he's to, he's to um, that they might turn from darkness to light, that they might turn from Satan and his domain to God. Um, and that so that they might receive the forgiveness of their sins. And all of this was done by faith in Christ Jesus. And, and, and through all this, they're going to receive what he says. They're going to receive their inheritance into God's holy family and enjoy the blessings of eternal life with God. And this is what Paul is telling all these Jews and Gentiles who came to hear what he had to say. It's, this is his commission from God. Okay. Now let's move on to the next verse. This is where that was last week, and let's move on to the first verse today, which is verse 19. So, King Agrippa, I did not prove disobedient to the heavenly vision. Yes, he says, "So, King Agrippa, I'm being obedient." I mean, Paul's encounter with the resurrected Christ radically changed his life, and he is telling King Agrippa that right now he's doing exactly uh, what he was supposed to do. He's being obedient to his commission from God. All right, let's read the next verse, verse 20. But kept declaring both to those of Damascus first, and also at Jerusalem, and then throughout all the region of Judea, and even to the Gentiles, that they should repent and turn to God, performing deeds appropriate to repentance. All right, now, so here we see Paul chronologically describing his ministry. Okay, first, he declared the gospel to those who were present in Damascus. Okay, then in Jerusalem, then throughout all of Judea. And then Paul tells Agrippa that he's, pre he's preached even to the Gentiles because he's done some preaching to the Gentiles. And it was this ministry, though, that got, got Paul in trouble with his fellow Jews, wasn't it? Then we see Paul tell Agrippa what he was telling all these other people. He says that they should repent and turn to God, performing the appro performing deeds appropriate to repentance. He's telling them that they should repent. Okay, what does it mean to repent? Turn and go the other way. Turn and go the other way. Yeah, that's pretty much it. It means it's the Greek word. It's the Greek word mentaneo, which means to change one's mind, to reconsider, to feel remorse. All that is part of mentaneo. Paul's telling them, he's telling everyone that they need to repent and turn to God. And it's funny, this is exactly what Jesus was telling everybody when he came out of the wilderness. 
He came this as he first started ministering. When he came out, when he was baptized, he went into the wilderness for 40 days. And when he came back, this is what he was saying. Let's look at that. Let's look at Mark. <clears throat> Mark 1, verse 14 and 15. And after John had been taken into custody, Jesus came into Galilee, preaching the gospel of God and saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Yeah, it's funny. When, when you look at Scripture and you read Scripture, you see all these things where John gets taken into prison, right? And I, I didn't realize that happened while Jesus was in the wilderness. I mean, I didn't realize that because he's, he's, yeah, he's, he's, after John had been taken into custody, Jesus is coming out of the wilderness. So I don't think he gets to see John again. Um, but anyway, he said, what he's saying here is that, um, is that to repent here, he's telling people to repent, okay? He said, the time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe. And that's what Jesus is telling him. But to repent means to change your mind concerning sin and concerning Jesus as the Messiah. And Jesus and Paul are telling people who had rejected Jesus to change their minds and accept him as the Messiah sent from God. It's interesting. Peter, in his sermon at Pentecost, called on the Jews also to repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus. Let's look at that in Acts 2. And there's two verses. I, I'm, I'm, if I could read 36 through 38, but we're just going to read 36 and 38 because that speaks to what's being said. Therefore, let all the house of Israel... Know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ. This Jesus whom you crucified. Repent and let each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Yeah, this is Pentecost, that, uh, that Pentecost day, the first one. Peter's calling the Jews. He says, he's calling, he says, let the house of Israel. So he's calling on all of the Jews to repent, to change their minds, to hate their past rejection of God's Messiah, Jesus, and embrace him in faith as their Messiah and Savior. And that's what Peter's telling them. And repentance involves recognizing that you have thought wrongly in the past, and you're choosing to think rightly in the future. You have a change of disposition, a new way of thinking about God, a new way about thinking about sin, a new way of thinking about holiness. True repentance is, promised, is, is prompted by a godly sorrow, which leads to salvation. Repentance is turning from our sin and turning to God. It requires that we realize that we have disobeyed God and violated his law. This is what Paul is telling Agrippa. And everyone else that was there. I mean, it's interesting. He's telling all these people that were there, he's telling them to repent and turn to God. <clears throat> turn is the Greek word epistreo. Epistreo means revert, come back, return, turn back. See, that's actually the word. The turn is the turn around and come around. The, one, the, the other is um, change your mind. All right? Paul here is telling the Jews to repent. And what do they have to repent from? Thoughts. Rejecting what? Rejecting, Jesus. rejecting, yeah. For their, 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 they rejected Jesus, right? They rejected Je the rejection of Jesus. They've got to repent from that, and that as their Messiah, and turn back to God. But what do the Gentiles have to repent from? You're a Gentile. What do we have to repent from? Sin. Sin. What else? Rejecting Jesus. Reject. Oh, pretty much, yeah. A godless life, right? It's, it's pretty much the same thing, but they never thought of, that they needed a Messiah, did they? But that, So basically, what he's telling them is to reject, re repent from their godless lifestyle and their idol worshiping and turn to God. It's not turning from something, it's turning to something. And that's epistrepho actually means both. It means turning from or turning to. Okay? And our initial repentance and, and turning let us all to a relationship with God, didn't it? But we must know that we all have times in our lives when we will need to repent and turn from sin and back to God again. Let's look at what Jesus said to Peter on, at the Last Supper, and that's in uh, Luke 22, verses 31 and 32. Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has demanded permission to sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith may not 
And you, when once you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. All right. Jesus is here speaking to Simon Peter, telling him that Satan wants to sift him like wheat. Okay? Satan wants to see if Peter's faith is true and can be broken. Okay? Um, God, and it's interesting, God has given Satan permission. And that's what, that's what he says here. He says, Satan has demanded permission to sift you like wheat, but, I, but I've given him permission. Okay? Um, and this verse tells us so much. It tells us that Satan has to ask permission to be able to do anything to any of us. Okay? Think about that. He has to ask permission. And if he's allowed, what's really interesting to me is that Jesus prays for us not to fail. Steve, I've got a note on that. Yeah. Um, on that verse 31 yeah. in Luke, where it's uh, to sift you like we, it says that you is plural. That meant if you was at, Satan had asked permission to sent, sift. Everybody. To sift everybody, that's right, yeah. And then the next verse, Jesus says, I'm praying for you, and that you is singular. It's singular, yeah, because he's asked, I think, I think Satan's wanting to, to sift everybody, but I think, yeah, I, I, I should have raised that thought, that he's trying to sift everybody, but he's, Jesus is only allowing him to sift people at that point, yeah. So it's interesting that he's doing that, but he says, but you know, Jesus is praying us not to fail, but if we do, and we repent, then we can come back to God. And it's real, what's real interesting here is we also see that Jesus seems to know that Peter will fail. Okay? Now, he's God, yes, but he's also man as, as he's here. But he, said, he's, we, we, he, he knows that Peter's going to fail because he says, But I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And you, when once you have turned again, strengthen your brother. So he's saying, I know you're going to fail. But you're going to repent, and then you're going to strike. You're going to come and strengthen your brothers. So Jesus is telling people that Peter that once he is turned back, and that is the Greek word epiphestro again. He says, "When you turn back again, strengthen your brothers." And it's because of this intercession of Jesus Christ that our faith, though sometimes sadly shaken, is never sunk. Because Jesus is in our court, guys, and that's what's great. Then the Holy Spirit is there too for us now. I mean, if we were left to ourselves, if I was left to myself, I can't speak for you. But if I was left to myself, I would fail. But praise God that through the intercession of Christ, we are held by his power. But then if we do fail, we need to repent and come back to Jesus, right? And those, those times come to all of us. I mean, we sin, we need to repent, and then we turn back to God. Repentance is something that should be ongoing in our lives. We should be, always be prepared to repent, confess our sins, and repent. Okay? It should be a regular discipline of our faith. None of us are sinless, so we should all be involved in, in the repentance that's needed. You know, if we fail to repent for a certain sin, that sin is going to destroy our lives. Okay? Because sin is a choice. It's always a choice. Sin is always a choice. And repentance is taking responsibility for the choice that we've made and seeking for the forgiveness of God. And that's what all this is about, okay? So now we'll go back into Acts. Yeah, Rusty. I'm fast forwarding to today. Uh, what is our responsibility like? Was it Peter was to support his brother to help him repent? What is our responsibility as Christians today in helping someone repent? Uh, repentance, first of all, starts with the person that wants to right. have a life change. They've got to want to. Yes. We can't talk them into it, but we can foster them into it with their decision. So, can we talk a little bit about that? Because we are all faced daily. We are faced with it daily, and we, we have friends that we see who are falling. We see they're falling into sin. They might not want to hear it, but you know we might need God. May be calling us to be the person that goes to them and and uh, presents them with their sin and help them through it. You know, because we want to help all our brothers and sisters to get out of the sin that they're in. And if they're not a believer, helping them get out of their sin and come to Christ is just as good, isn't it? Thoughts? Yeah, the word repentance is such a it is. Key word in yep. the Bible. 
But I mean, what, what this is all talking about is for us, if we fall into sin, it's calling us to always repent and turn back to Jesus. Yep. And that's why I was bringing all this up because repentance is something we need to have in our lives always. So it's a, just a, should be a daily thing to look at the sin in our lives and ask God for forgiveness because he's got it. Yeah, Sally. Well, you know, there are those people who think they're already right and they don't have anything to repent of. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we all know a few of those. <laughs> it's hard. No, I mean, all we can do is help as God prompts, I would think. Yep. Live the life before them and then... Yeah, and, and, and live your Christian life before them, and then it's like what Steve may be saying, right? Yeah. Yep. Also, God uh, said, uh, if you don't worship me, these rocks will worship me. Absolutely. Yep. They'll cry. Yep. But it's our responsibility, I think, as brothers and sisters in Christ to help people through the difficulties they're going through, I would think. Yeah, pray the Holy Spirit on them. That's absolutely true. <laughs> pray the Holy Spirit. There you go. He can't beat the Holy Spirit. That's, that's right. <laughs> Just All right, now I've got a few minutes, so let's go back to Acts, then to Acts, okay? Acts 20, does that help, Rusty? I mean, okay. All right, let's go back to Acts 20. It doesn't solve his problem, though. It doesn't solve your problem, oh, okay. Acts 26, verse 20, okay? Paul is saying, change your mind. Turn back to God, and you will perform deeds that are appropriate to someone who has changed his or her mind. Okay? Paul is preaching how to become a Christian, how to become a believer. He's preaching holiness. And who is he, pre who is he preaching this to? Gentiles, right? He's preaching it to, well, he's preaching it to non-believing Jews and Gentiles there at Caesarea. Okay? Because King Agrippa, he, he, I mean, King Agrippa's there listening, and he's living with his sister Bernice. And history tells us he's not living with her in a godly fashion. So, you know, he's, that, he's preaching right at him. And he's preaching the message of, Paul's preaching the message of salvation. And who set all this up? God set it all up. I mean, God put Paul exactly where he needed him to get him to this point. I mean, he was, he was being beaten to death, wasn't he, at the temple. Again, and God intervened, okay? And, uh, so he, he set it all up. And he, he arranged it to make all this happen because Paul made his life available to God. And I think that's, we need to remember that. We need to make ourselves available to God to do it as he pleases. And it may, might not be something we, we want to do. It might be something we're scared to do. But it might be, and with what you were talking about, Rusty, it might be something where we can come in to someone's life for Christ. But, I, you know, it's on, only God will tell you how pushy you need to be, you know. All right, so Paul continues with his testimony. Verse uh, 21. For this reason... Some Jews seized me in the temple and tried to put me to death. Yeah, this is a continuation of his testimony. He says, for this reason. <coughs> what was the reason that some Jews wanted to seize Paul and kill him? Stop it. He was preaching the gospel, but to whom was he preaching it to? Gentiles, okay? He was preaching it to Gentiles, and they didn't like that <coughs> at all. All right, let's go on to verse 22. So having obtained help from God... I stand to this day testifying both to small and great, stating nothing but what the prophets and Moses said was going to take place. All right, so how did Paul obtain help from God in all this? I mean, who rescued Paul from the angry Jews? The little kid. Huh? The young man. It, well, it was, it, yeah, it was a young man. It was, well, it was actually Flavius Joseph. It was, it was Claudius Lysias. <clears throat> the Roman procurator, the yeah, Roman the commander. Had what? He overheard the plot. That yeah, that's right. So he he actually did it. Yeah, but <clears throat> it was Claudius um, Claudius Lysias, the Roman commander, who saved Paul. Yet Paul says it was God who saved him. Why would Paul have said it was God? Well, I think it's because he knows that God controls all things. And nothing that happens can happen apart from God's hand. And I want to, we, we, uh, I can do this, I think, in the next five minutes, we'll get you people that are going to the contemporary service out. The, um, it, well, let's look at the truth of this in the book of Job. We'll start with Job 2, verses 6 through 9. All right. 
So the Lord said to Satan, Behold, he is in your power, only spare his life. Then Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and smote Job with sore boils from the sole of his foot to the crown of his head. And he took a potsherd to scrape himself while he was sitting among the ashes. Then his wife said to him, Do you still hold fast your integrity? Curse God and die. All right. So who does our text say afflicted Job? Satan. Satan, Satan, right? Okay. But Job's wife tells him, curse God and die. If Satan did this, why does she tell him to curse God? Because she's mad. She's, she's mad. She's real mad. I mean, and he's over there sitting in ashes, and he's got boils all over himself. I mean, that had to have been awful. She was probably a little bit tired of this thing. Yeah, she might have been. Yeah. Are you kidding? <laughs> okay, well, I think because just like Paul, both Job, both Job and his wife, know that all things come through the hand of God. Let's look at Job's response in the next verse, verse 10. But he said to her, You speak as one of the foolish women speaks. Shall we indeed accept good from God and not accept adversity? In all this, Job did not sin with his lips. Yeah, guys, I don't think we should follow his lead here. I mean, <laughs> following our wife foolish. Where can you go after the ash heap? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so Job's wife, Job's wife tells him to curse God and die. And Job's comes back and he says, You foolish women, woman, shall we, not, shall we accept the good things? but not the bad. I mean, he's saying, I mean, all this comes from God, okay? The Hebrew word here for adversity, which that one is, or what I said bad, is the word ra. And ra means, that's the Hebrew word, and it, it's translated as evil, okay? And Job clearly sees the evil that is happening to him as a thing from God. And we see, I mean, and we see earlier that Job did not it says that Job did not sin from his lips. In verse 120, in 122, it tells us that Job, Job did not sin or blame God. I mean, Job and his wife both knew just what Paul knew, that all things come from the hand of God, both the things we see as good and the things we see as bad or evil. Okay, so that's, that's, that's why I, th I think that's why Paul is seeing all this coming from God because he was saved by the Gentile Romans, but he, was, he says it was God who saved him. And you know, um, that G back to Paul, we see that he, he sees all the help that he receives from Rome is help from God. And he tells Agrippa that he stands there giving credit to God for everything, both the small things and the big. Okay, and we're gonna cut off there because people do need to leave, but um, any questions or any thoughts? Yeah, the other thing is, I think it's semantics uh, more than anything, but uh, when I look at look at this, I, I consider that God is always in control, and God either hands-on directs things, or he allows things to happen. Right. You know, and there are bad things that God allows to happen, but I'm uncomfortable with saying God did, did this to me, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, it's, it's yeah, we his master plan. I mean, yeah. yep. we, we, we broke uh, somebody broke that a long time ago, right? And, and if he hadn't, I'm pretty sure I would have. Yeah. So God picked the right man in Job because he did. None of us probably I can't imagine without the help of God could yeah. have done what Job did and held and held his own, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, he stood his ground. Yeah, but he knew he that all everything. things come come from God, and that's what Paul's saying. He knows he was saved by God because God controls it all. Yeah. Anything else? Yeah. Houston. We all like to win in anything we do, whether it's games or life. We like to be on the winning side. And in one of David Jeremiah's daily devotionals, it says you and God are a majority. So I try to think of that every day and uh, be in the majority and the winning side. Absolutely. That's a, that's, that's a good way to finish. Thanks, Houston. Anybody else? All right, let's pray.